Okay, so this is the last unit in the topic of stoichiometry, reacting masses and volumes. So those are the learning objectives which you need to go through, tick them off, and make sure that you are up to speed with all the learning objectives for this particular unit of the topic. So the first thing I want to look at is theoretical and percentage yield. So percentage yield is the actual yield, okay, what you get from the experiment, divided by the theoretical yield, which is what you calculate from the molar calculations, times 100. And this will determine how effective your experiment was, whether you've lost material, and whether you need to improve the experiment, how efficient it is, how you've used the, the reactants to make the product. And the percentage error is going to be the actual yield, the yield you get, minus the yield you expect from your calculations, divided by the yield you expect from the calculations, times 100. Okay, so in the exam, you're going to have to learn how to do percentage yield problems. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to write a balanced equation, list all the knowns and unknowns, convert to moles, use mole ratios to determine the unknowns, convert to a mass, and then use percentage yield formula. Okay, those are the six steps to get 100% in these kind of questions. And in the next slide, we're going to look at an example of a percentage yield problem and see if we can work it out. Okay, the problem is, if 45 grams of ammonia comes from 42.03 grams of nitrogen with excess hydrogen, so excess means you've got it in large amounts, what is the percentage yield of the reaction? And because I'm a generous teacher, I have given you the balanced equation. Okay, so pause the video now and see if you can work it out using the rules that I have just given you. Okay, so this is the answer you should have got. Okay, the first step is write the balanced equation. It's already up there. You list all the unknowns and, un and knowns. So the number of, uh, the mass of the nitrogen is known from the question. Okay, it's right there. The uh, mass of the nitrogen is, is known from your periodic table. You can calculate that, the molecular mass. Uh, the, the mass of the ammonia is also uh, a known in terms of what you got from the experiment. But the, uh, but the molar mass is also known from the periodic table, but you need to calculate the mass of the ammonia you would get theoretically if there was 100% yield. Okay, so to do that, you have to convert to moles. Okay, so the number of moles of nitrogen, which is what we know here, okay, is going to be mass of the nitrogen, okay, from the question divided by the molar mass, which we get from our periodic table, 28.02, which gives you one and a half moles. Okay, and then use the mole ratio from the equation to determine the unknowns. So the equation says for every mole of nitrogen, it reacts with three moles of hydrogen to give two moles of ammonia. So therefore, it's a mole ratio of one to two, one mole of nitrogen for every two moles of ammonia. Therefore, if you have one mole of uh, one, one and a half moles of nitrogen, and you need to find x moles of ammonia, do your cross multiplication. So it's going to be x is going to be two times one and a half, so three moles of ammonia. So now we have the number of moles of ammonia. You can then convert that to a mass. Okay, rearranging the equation. So the mass of ammonia is going to be the number of moles of ammonia, which we've just calculated above. Uh, times the molar mass of ammonia, 17.03, which we've got from our periodic table, which will give 51.12 grams of ammonia, if it was 100% yield, okay? This is based on 100% yield, okay? The theoretical. So then we crank in our percentage yield field formula. So percentage yield equals the experimental yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100, so it's going to be 45 divided by 51.12 times 100. So it's going to be 88.03%, which is our final answer. And not a bad yield for that kind of reaction. Okay, so that's percentage yield calculations. Now let's look at limiting reactants or reagents. So sometimes we don't always have perfect amounts of the reactants. So in the previous example, we had an excess of hydrogen and a limited amount of uh, nitrogen. So we can only make as much product as the limiting reactant will allow. So the first thing we must do is determine which reactant is limiting. 
Okay, and again, just like in the percentage yield calculations, there is a simple four-step way of doing this. We simply balance the chemical equation, find the number of moles of each reactant, divide the number of moles by the coefficient found in the balanced equation, and the chemical that has the smallest value is known as the limiting reactant. So what does this look like in practice? Okay, so here is a problem. We have 2.5 thousand kilograms of methane, and it's mixed with three times uh, 3,000 kilograms of water. What is the reactant is limiting? What is the mass of each reactant? And what is the mass of the reactant left? Now I've given you an equation, okay, to start off with. So going through the steps in the previous slide, can you answer the questions one, two, three? Okay, so welcome back. Let's do this, okay? Three questions. First question is, what is the limiting reactant? Look now first at which one is the limiting reagent. The number of moles of water is going to be, of course, from the equation, the mass over the molar mass. So it's going to be 3,000 kilograms divided by 18 grams per mole. Now notice what I've done here. I have had to convert it to grams, okay, to be consistent, because obviously you've got grams per mole as the unit for the molar mass. So it's going to give you 1.667 uh, times 10 to the 5 mole. For methane, correspondingly, the mass divided by the molar mass, 2,500 uh, kilograms divided by 16. So we're again converting it to grams divided by 16, 1.5563 times 10 to the 5 moles. This number is smaller than that number, so therefore the methane is the limiting reagent. So methane plus water gives carbon monoxide and a little bit of trick for young players, three hydrogens. So I didn't give you the balanced equation. I'm sometimes nasty like that. So number of moles of methane is going to be 1.563 times 10 to the 5 mole. So the mole ratio is going to be one mole of methane to one mole of carbon monoxide to three moles of hydrogen. Okay, three moles because it's three moles here in the equation. Therefore, there is 1.563 times 10 to the 5 moles for carbon monoxide. So the mass of carbon monoxide is going to be number of moles times the molar mass, 1.563 times 10 to the 5 times 28 grams per mole. Okay, that should be grams per mole. Okay, uh, it's going to equal 4.3 times 10 to the 6 grams of carbon monoxide. And the moles, uh, sorry, the mass of hydrogen is going to be 1.563 times 10 to the 5 moles times uh, 2 grams per mole, okay, times 3 because of the equation uh, ratio. So it's going to be 9.4 times 10 to the 5 grams of hydrogen. Last question, leftover uh, number of moles of water is going to be 1.667 times 10 to the 5 minus... 1.563 times 10 to the 5 moles, because this guy's all reacted. So it's going to leave 0 0.1037 times 10 to the 5 moles of uh, water left. The mass is going to be number of moles of water left times the molar mass, which is going to equal 1.867 times 10 to the 5 grams. Therefore, 1.867 times 10 to the 5 grams of water is left remaining in the reaction. Right, so we've now looked at uh, percentage yield. Uh, we've also now looked at uh, the limiting reagent. So now let's look at gases in terms of stoichiometry and the laws. Stoichiometry. So it's all based down to Avogadro, okay, the guy with the big number. So one mole of gas equals 22.7 litres at standard temperature impressor. Now standard temperature impressor is shortcutted to STP. And it's at zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. That's the conditions for standard temperature and pressure. And conversions, one litre equals one decimeter cubed. One milliliter equals one centimeter cubed. So there's a thousand centimeter cubed in the one decimeter cubed. So this is the strategy for gases. In previous slides, I've given you the strategy for solids. Okay, so... We have the number of moles equals volume, which is usually given in a question, 
divided by 22.7 decimeters cubed per mole. From the equation, you get a ratio of mole A to mole B. So the unknown volume will be based on the number of moles, which you've got from the ratio, times 22.7 decimeter cubed per mole. Okay, so here is a problem. Uh, Quicklime calcium oxide, which is a solid, is produced by the thermal decomposition, so you're basically heating it, uh, of calcium carbonate or limestone. So calculate the volume of carbon dioxide gas produced at standard temperature and pressure. So this is huge. This is always given in the question, so you know what you're dealing with. Okay, from decomposition of 152 grams of calcium carbonate. Okay, so pause the video now and see if you can get the correct answer. Right, so welcome back. So you should have got this. Okay, so first thing you do is the equation. Calcium carbonate gives calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, one to one ratio. Number of moles of calcium carbonate, therefore using the equation as mass divided by molar mass, which will give 152 divided by 100, or 1.52 mole. So one mole of calcium oxide gets one mole of carbon dioxide from the equation. Therefore, 1.52 moles of carbon dioxide is created. The volume of carbon dioxide is going to be number of moles times the uh, molar, the gas molar value, 22.7 decimeter cubed per mole. So it's going to give you 34.5 decimeter cubed of carbon dioxide. Quite a lot. Okay, so in order to fully understand uh, the gas gases, you have to understand the gas laws. Okay. So we have something called the ideal gas. It's basically a model, okay, and it has five different qualities. So in reality, gases aren't, don't behave like this, but for our models, we make the following assumptions. Okay, we assume the particles in the gas are in random motion. Okay, the particles are all colliding with each other as well as the walls of the container. Okay, two and three are big assumptions that the volume occupied by a gas particle is negligible compared to the volume occupied by the gas. That only happens in ideal gases. Okay, In reality, gases are unideal, but for our models, we say that, that at least 0.2 is held. Okay, And that the forces of attraction between the particles are negligible. Okay, Basically, they're infinitely distanced apart, so there's no interaction between the molecules. That all collisions between particles uh, with the walls are perfectly elastic. Okay, and elastic just means that no energy is actually lost. It's all conserved within the container. And that the average kinetic energy of the particles is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. Okay, so temperature is a measure of the average amount of kinetic energy of the particles in the gas. Okay, there's an example there of an alcohol rocket. So at certain temperatures, they have a certain gas pressure. So this is the reason why you'd use propanone over ethanoic acid, because the vapor pressure of propanone is a lot higher at uh, each temperature than ethanoic acid. So you can therefore have the expansion of the uh, combustion chamber shoot out, and you can just fire off into space. Okay, so the first law we'll look at is Boyle's law. P1V1 equals P2V2. What that's basically saying is that the, the pressure is related inversely with the uh, volume. Okay, so as you increase the pressure, the volume is going to decrease. Okay, so because it's an inverse relationship, the graph of pressure over 1 over volume is going to be a straight line at constant moles and constant temperature. Okay, and there's a wonderful animation there. Okay, as you increase the volume, the pressure goes down, and as you decrease the volume, the pressure goes up Okay, at constant temperature and the same number of particles or moles. Okay, the next experiment or law is Charles's law. Okay, V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. And this is constant, again, same number of particles for, for the system and the same constant pressure. Okay, so the volume is going to be proportional to the temperature. As you increase the temperature of a vessel, the volume is going to increase. Makes sense. Okay, there we go. So 
So as you increase the temperature, the volume of the container is going to increase. Now the next one is Guy Lussac's law. The boys in the class usually find that rather amusing. So P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2 at constant number of particles and constant volume. So at constant mass and constant volume, the pressure is directly related to temperature. So as you increase the temperature, the pressure is going to increase if you keep the volume constant and the same number. Of okay. There is always exceptions to the rule. Okay. At cold temperatures, gas particles tend to stick together, which kind of breaks the ideal gas law in a way because there's no interaction supposedly between the particles. Okay. So also there's hydrogen bonding being broken uh, in water, for example, uh, and in ethanol. So you're seeing an uh, exponential rise in pressure due to that. Okay. And then Lord Kelvin discovered the, or the origin of the Kelvin scale. For a fixed mass of a gas at constant volume, the temperature, as the temperature increases, it's going to have an increased pressure between the two different volumes, where V1, V2 is greater than V1. It's going to be a point where it condenses. Okay. So the ideal gas law is PV equals nRT. Okay, where P is pressure, must be in uh, pascals or newtons per meter squared. Volume is in meters cubed. Okay, so you must divide by 1,000 for decimeters cubed to meters cubed. Number of moles is N. T is in Kelvin, and it's the, pressure, uh, the temperature. And R is a gas constant of 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. Uh, so if you're using PV equals nRT, then units must be pascals, meters cubed, and Kelvin. Okay, so now we're going to apply this. So a deep sea diver is working at a depth where the pressure is about three atmospheres. He's breathing out air bubbles. The volume of each gas bubble is two centimeters cubed. At the surface of the pressure, uh, surface of the, the water, the lake, it's one atmosphere. What is the volume of each bubble when it reaches the surface? What will happen to his blood if he goes to the surface? Okay, so pause your video now. Using Okay, our gas law here, PV equals nRT. Okay, let's see if we can work out the answers to these questions. Right, so welcome back. So P1, V1 equals two P, uh, P2V2. So we've given all these numbers. Okay, so we've got three atmospheres as the first pressure, and the volume is uh, V1. We're told that uh, V2 is one atmosphere, so we're trying to find uh, V2 here. So three atmospheres uh, times two centimetres equals one atmosphere times x centimetres. Therefore, x has to be six centimetres. So the volume of the bubble is six decimetres cubed, which makes sense, okay? As the bubble increases up into the, uh, the surface of the lake, it's going to increase in size as there's less pressure up there, pushing on the surface of the bubble. Okay, problem two. A sample of hydrogen gas has a volume of 8.56 litres at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius and a pressure of one and a half atmospheres. Calculate the moles of hydrogen gas present in this gas sample and the gas constant has been given. And also the gas law of PV equals RT must have the correct units. Remember that. Okay, so pausing the video now, let's see if we can get the correct answer. Okay, so the pressure equals 1.5 times 101 kilopascals, converting it to pascals. Okay, the volume has to be converted into meters cubed. So it's 8.56 times 10 to the 3, negative 3 meters cubed. And temperature has to be converted to Kelvin, 673 Kelvin. We plug the numbers in. We get 1297 equals N2270. So N has to be 0.57 moles of hydrogen. For extra, we have Dalton's law of partial pressure. So as the type of gas doesn't affect the gas law, it follows that the each gas must act as a unit in causing the gas pressure. So the law of partial pressure states that the total gas uh, pressure of the vapour is equal to the partial pressures of each of the individual gases in the mixture. Okay, so it follows from PV equals nRT that P1N1 equals P total over N total. Okay, so the the partial pressure of, of one gas 
over the number of moles of that gas will be equal to the ratio of the total pressure divided by the number of moles in the entire system. So P1 equal to the mole fraction of 1 times P total, so pressure of the first gas will equal the mole fraction of the gas times the total pressure. So with that in mind, let's try and answer a problem. So a balloon contains 0.2 moles of nitrogen and 0.5 moles of oxygen. If the total pressure in the balloon is two atmospheres, what is the partial pressure of the oxygen? So if we pause the video now, we can find an answer. Okay, so welcome back. So P1 equals X1 times total pressure. So 0.5 divided by 0.2 moles plus 0.5 moles of oxygen times two atmospheres, 1.4 atmospheres. Okay, so that was gases. Now we're finishing off with looking at liquids in terms of concentration and titration, which you should all be familiar with now, so we've just done it. Okay, so concentration. The key words are solute, solvent, solution, and concentration. So solute is something that dissolves, so sugar or salt. Solvent is something it dissolves in, like water. Solution is a mixture of the solvents and the uh, solutes. So, for example, salt water, sugar water, a cup of tea. Okay, concentration is the measure of the amount of solute in the solution. For example, one mole per decimeter cubed of sodium chloride. Okay, so solution. So concentration equals the number of moles divided by volume. So one centimeter cubed equals one mil. One decimeter cubed equals one litre. 1 decimeter over 1 decimeter cubed is 1 decimeter to the minus 3, just another way of writing it. And concentration is always used uh, using square brackets. For example, hydrogen square brackets is the concentration of the hydrogen atom. Of course, it wouldn't be the molecule because that would be H2. Okay. So concentration can be written in three ways. Moles over decimeters cubed, moles decimeters cubed to the minus 3, or capital M. All of those are acceptable. So I prefer you to use the first two here. So parts per million are uh, also can be considered, considered, so measured as parts per million of solute, so often calculated as one milligram in a litre or one or kilogram of a substance such as water. So because one kilogram, one litre is interchangeable. Okay, so just with the gases and with the solids, Liquid strategy, okay, so we have the concentration of A, we have a mole ratio for the equation, we can then work out the concentration of B from the number of moles from the equation divided by the total volume. Okay, so problem one, a solution contains 2.65 grams of anhydrous sodium carbonate in 200 centimetres cubed of solution. Calculate the concentration of the solution. And I have generously given you the molar mass of, or relative molar mass, of the sodium carbonate. Right, so hopefully we would have got an answer. So the first thing you have to do is convert the number of moles of sodium carbonate, so mass over molar mass. 2.65 divided by 106, so it's 0.025 moles. Okay, and it's going to be concentration of sodium carbonate. It's going to be number of moles divided by the volume. So 0.025 divided by 0.2. Noticing, of course, we're converting 200 centimetres into decimetres cubed here. So the final concentration is 0.125 moles per decimetre cubed, or 0.125 molar. Okay. Question number two, what mass of sodium, hydrox uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate, NHCO3, will be required to prepare 100 centimetres cubed of two molar solution? Okay, two moles per litre, or two, sorry, two moles per decimetres cubed solution. And again, the sodium hydrogen carbonate has been added. Okay, so hopefully, if you've got it right, the answer should be 16.8. How did we get there? Concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate is number of moles divided by volume. We have that from the uh, question. So it's going to be N equals 0.1 decimeters cubed. 
So N has to be 2 times 0.1 or 0.2 mole. And the mass is going to be rearranging the equation again, which we had for solids. Uh, number of moles times molar mass, so 0.2 times 84, 16.8 grams. Okay, so finally, this is what we've been doing for the last uh, three weeks or so, titration. Okay, so a titration is a method of finding unknown concentrations using known concentrations called a standard solution. Okay, uh, and standard solution is a solution which of a precisely known concentration, also known as a primary standard, and it's made on an analytical balance with a volumetric flask of only 99.99% accuracy. So for IB, no uncertainties are required for your standard solution. And the equivalence point or end point is where the titration stops, and the indicator is a chemical you add to notice that you've gone at the, uh, past the equivalence point, and an analyte is a chemical being measured, and it's also called a titrate or aliquot. Right, so this is the apparatus that you'd be using, which we have been using, clinical flask, volumetric flask, burette, which is used to either put the uh, drop the base or drop the acid into the conical flask containing either acid or base, the volumetric pipette, which is very accurate, okay, um, so it's very, uh, it delivers an accurate volume, okay, so that's quite necessary to determine the concentrations accurately. And just a little bit of a tip about using glassware, so we've already looked at this in previous slides, so rinse the solution of the pipette, fill it up, adjust the level, uh, using the calibration line, notice here, avoiding the parallax error. Okay, so you're parallel with the calibration line when you're doing that. You drain, and a drop remains at the tip. No problems. And the burette, you rinse with the solution, you fill up with the solution, and you record again the initial reading from the meniscus. Okay, this thing here, the meniscus. Okay, and again... Try to avoid parallax error by being parallel to the meniscus when you're reading it. Okay. And using glass with a volumetric flask, so you're accurately weighing out your sample of the primary standard. You transfer it into the volumetric flask. You complete, ensure complete transfer by washing the, 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 um, the beaker or the container that you've transferred the solid into the volumetric flask with water. You dissolve the primary standard by, in water by shaking and then bring it up to the level by just adding it dropwise through a pipette. Okay, and indicators, uh, there's quite a number of different indicators. So if you have a titration between a strong acid and a strong base, like sodium hydroxide and um, sodium uh, hydrochloric acid, then you could either use methyl orange, litmus, or phenylphthalein. Okay, we use phenylphthalein because you notice that the, um, the change occurs around the end point here. Okay, about eight or nine where it is for a, um, a end point for a strong acid, strong base uh, titration. If you have a strong acid like uh, hydrochloric acid at a weak base like ammonia, you'd use uh, methyl orange because the color changes at in the acidic range. Okay, so you can see here, it's going to be favoring the acidic range. Um, and if it's a, a strong, a weak acid like uh, ethanoic acid or vinegar, and a strong base like sodium hydroxide, you use phenylphthalein because it's changing again at a uh, basic range. And a weak acid, weak base, or ammonia, uh, ethanoic acid, it's nothing suitable for an indicator because there's no pH change occurring at the right uh, endpoint. No colour change happening at the right end point. So dilutions. So when a solution is diluted, more solvent is added to it, the number of moles of solute stays the same. So N1 equals number of moles of solute before dilution, equal N2 number of moles of solute after dilution. So make N the subject and substitute, it follows that C1 V1 equals C2 V2. Where C1 is the original concentration of the solution, V1 is the original volume of the solution, C2 is the new concentration of the solution after diluting, and V2 is the new volume of the solution after dilution. Okay, so just to finish off, a couple of titration problems. So problem number one, 
is calculate the volume of 12 mole per dec moles per decimeter cubed HCl solution that should be diluted with still water to obtain a 1 decimeter cubed solution of a 0.5 moles per decimeter cubed of the acid. Okay, so pause the video now and let's see if we can get an answer. Okay, so welcome back. So C1 equals 12 moles per decimeter cube. We don't know what the final volume is. Oh, sorry, the first volume is. C2 equals 0 0.05, but we do know the final volume is going to be 1 decimeter cubed. So from the equation C1V1 equals C2V2, 12 moles per decimeter cubed times V1 is going to be equal 0 0.05 times 1 uh, decimeter cubed. So V1, therefore, is going to be 0 0.04 decimeter cubed. So 4 centimetres cubed of 12 molar solution needs to be added to make up to 1 litre to make a 0 0.05 molar final solution. And finally, 20 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid tit titrate was neutralised by 25 centimetres of 0 0.1 moles per centimetre cubed sodium hydroxide standard solution. Calculate the concentration of the acid. I have been generous. I have given you the balanced equation, so it should be a little bit easier. So pause the video now and see if you can get the right answer. Okay, so welcome back. So number of moles of sodium hydroxide will equal C times V. So it's going to be 0 0.1 times 0 0.025. So 0 0.0025 mole of sodium hydroxide. One mole of sulfuric acid is going to give a ratio, uh, react with two moles of sodium hydroxide from the equation. Okay, so we've got... There we go, so that's the, the 2, that's the reason why we have 2 molar sodium hydroxide. So X is going to be 0.025 molar, so X has to be 0.0125 moles of sulfuric acid. Okay, so 2 to 1 ratio. So the concentration of sulfuric acid, notice the square brackets, is number of moles divided by the volume, so 0.0125 molar divided by 0.2 decimeters cubed, so 0.0625 moles per decimeters cubed which kind of makes sense because it's about the same amount of volume, so it's just going to be slightly uh, less concentrated than the sodium hydroxide. Okay, so that's, I think, enough for the unit. Next, next topic is going to be atomic structure.